Hi, this is Professor Dorr, and this is lecture number 10 of EE310. This lecture covers instantaneous and average power. And this lecture and the next lecture will cover sections 11.1 to 11.4 of Alexander and Sadaku's electric circuits text. And we're going to start off discussing the idea of instantaneous power, and then we're going to move quickly toward average power. And in this lecture, I'm going to take some time to highlight a lot of intuitive concepts about power, um, such as the idea of how inductors and capacitors are energy storage elements. They don't dissipate any energy. Inductors and capacitor, they'll take energy in, but then they'll throw it back again, and then they'll take it in and throw it back again, but they don't ever dissipate energy. And I'm going to show you how you can use those concepts to make problems a little bit um, simpler. So before we start off, let's look at some background concepts. Um, a statement regarding energy is, I hiked up the mountain. I started at the bottom, I went to the top, or part way up, and what I am telling what I am saying is I just did a certain amount of joules worth of work because I started down here and I ended up here. And so what I'm really telling you is how much how much work I did. Now I may have hiked up to the top of that mountain really quickly. Or I might have hiked up, which is more the case, very slowly. So let's look at how we can quantify that. The power is joules per second. Or in other words, how much energy did I do per unit time? Well, here's a statement about power. I can hike a thousand vertical feet in one hour. So that is a that is a, a statement regarding my power output. But can I do that all day? No. So let's make a statement regarding work and power. I hiked up the mountain in one hour. So hiked up the mountain, that's the number of joules that I did of work, and I did it in one hour. So Take your power bill. Your power bill is in units of kilowatt hours. And let's look at that. Kilowatts or watts is going to be joules per second times hours times seconds times time, I guess. And that comes out to be joules. So what the power company is charging you for is how many joules. Uh, it's the same way they specify the, um, the power for the battery in your electric vehicle or your electric motorcycle. So we're talking about joules, but if you love cars and motorcycles and small engines like I do, they're rated in horsepower. And a real useful relationship, and it's one of the few things I actually remember, is that one horsepower is 746 watts. So the lawnmower that's out mowing the lawn is probably about three horsepower. So it's about 2,200 watts. Um, the mini bike I had when I was a kid, one of the mini bikes I had when I was a kid was five horsepower. It was about 3,500 watts. A um, 100 horsepower engine, or a 300 horsepower engine in your car, that's a lot of watts. So these are just some background concepts about power that are going to put things in perspective before we get to the math. So let's begin talking about instantaneous power. And the definition of instantaneous power is the instantaneous voltage times the instantaneous current in a device. 
Uh, you might remember from your last class with resistors, power is equal to voltage times current. And it's not changing because it's DC. So, but now that we're working with AC, we're going to describe this concept of instantaneous power, which is the voltage as a function of time multiplied by the current as a function of time. Let's do it here. We have a voltage source that is cosine omega t. And the instantaneous power is going to be V of t times I of t. Well, the voltage across that resistor is going to be cosine omega t. And of course, the current through the resistor is just going to be V over R. So it's going to be cosine omega t over 2. So instantaneous power, voltage times current is going to give us cosine omega t, and my mouse just died. My apologies, my mouse just died, and I used a naughty word, so I had to edit it out of this video. So we're computing the instantaneous power in this 2 ohm resistor, and it is equal to V of t times I of t. Or in other words, we're getting the power dissipated at any time in this resistor. And we knew our voltage was cosine omega t, because that's the voltage across the resistor. And the current is just going to be the voltage divided by 2 ohms. That's going to give us cosine omega t divided by 2. So we multiply these cosines together, and we get 1 half cosine squared omega t. And let's plot it and see what it looks like. So on our y-axis, we have the instantaneous power, and on the x-axis, we have time. Looks kind of like a sine wave, but that's just because I didn't draw it very well. It's not a sine wave because it's a square of a, of a sinusoid. But let's just take a look at this. Okay, down here, I see zero instantaneous power. What do you think the voltage is at this point right here? Well, of course, the voltage is going to be zero, and the current is going to be zero. And so those are going to multiply to be zero. So when the voltage waveform is going through zero, I'm going to get zero instantaneous power. Now, it could be going through zero going up. It could be going through zero going down. Now, let's look at the peak. Where do I get the, the peak power? Well, if the voltage is at a maximum, or this cosine is equal to 1, then the current is going to be uh, 1 half. It's going to be maximized, and it's going to be positive. And that's going, going to give me a positive peak. But now, what if that cosine is all the way down at its negative peak? It's at negative 1. Well, now the current's going to be negative 1, so I'm going to get another positive peak, aren't I? So what that means is for my positive peak here, this might be where the cosine was uh, at 1, and then the cosine goes down through zero and goes to negative one, but you can see the power is going to go back up again, and it's just going to keep doing that. So obviously, this waveform has a frequency that's equal to twice the frequency uh, of the original signal, right? Because the original signal has, in one period, has two places where it's zero. And so here are the two places where it's zero, and it has two places where it's going to be maximized. The instantaneous power is maximized, and that's going to be at the peak of that cosine wave and at the trough of that cosine wave. So this is the instantaneous power um, dissipated by our resistor. Looks like it's positive all the time. 
do we like that result? Well, I like the result because a resistor is, it can only dissipate power. It's not like the resistor is ever going to provide you any power <clears throat> unless you consider Brownian motion, but we're not doing that in EE310, and it's not a lot of power anyway. Um, but so the resistor is not going to supply power, and you could say, oh, well, maybe the resistor will just store power. Uh-uh. Resistors don't store power. So when I look at my little plotted equation here, I'm liking this equation because it makes good sense to me. Okay, so now let's move from the resistive case to a general component. And here's our general component. And I'm going to call it Z because it might be inductive, it might be resistive, it might be capacitive, it might be a bunch of stuff together. Um, and I'm going to show my passive sign convention. Here's the positive voltage, here's the negative voltage, and then I'm showing the current through it. So the voltage across this device is going to be Vmax cosine omega t plus the phase of the voltage. Very general expression. Why do I call this Vmax? The reason I do is because I know that the cosine has a peak value of one. So I know that this really is going to be the maximum of the whole thing. That's why I call it Vmax. So here's our expression for the voltage. And here is our expression for the current through this device. It's going to be Imax times cosine omega t plus phi i. So I don't know what phi V and phi I are, but the omegas are going to be the same. So let's go back to our definition of instantaneous power, and let's get the instantaneous power for this component. It's going to be V times I, V of T times I of T which here's our V, it's V sub M cosine blah, 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 multiplied by I sub M cosine omega T plus phi I. And let's use this trigonometric identity for the cosine of one, one cosine multiplied by another. Cosine A times cosine B is equal to a half cosine A minus B plus cosine A plus B. Surprisingly, this is a formula that I remember because we use it for mixers in radios and it describes the frequency translation process, but that's kind of an aside. So let's take our trigonometric identity and apply it to this equation right here, which is our instantaneous power. So here we go. I've got power of T is one half V sub M cosine A minus B. Well, A minus B is just going to be um, omega T plus phi I minus omega T minus phi I. I'm sorry, minus phi V. Sorry, I goofed that. It's going to be cosine of omega T plus phi V minus omega t minus phi i. And what we see, and this is the important thing, is the omega t's um, subtracted. And so we're not left with omega t. So this first term in our identity is a constant, isn't it? It's just a constant. Now let's do our second term. Now I got to add everything together. So I'm going to get um, 2 omega t plus um, phi v plus phi i. This is actually, um, yeah, 2 omega t plus phi v plus phi i. So this term is time varying. This term is not. Let's plot this term by itself. It is right here. It's this line. And then riding on this line is this time varying part. So you can see that here. And let's actually go 
Actually, let's not. Let's keep going. So the instantaneous power for my generalized component here has a constant part, here it is, and a time varying part, which is this. And the average power, the average power is the constant part, which is just this. Because remember, we have no time varying going on here. This is cosine phi v minus phi i, it's just a constant. So this is just the constant part. And you might say, really? And I'll say, yeah, because this second part, it goes up and then it goes down the same amount with the same shape. So you can see that this averages out to this. So now what I want to do is I want to determine the average power for a waveform with period T. Now you might ask, we started off here with instantaneous power, but he's kind of moving, he's getting real interested in average power. Why is that? It's because the instantaneous power is going up and it's going down and it's going up and it's going down. And um, what I really care about is the average power, right? That's what I'm get, what I'm paying for on my power bill. So we're going to see that in these derivations, we really want the average power. So let's define the average power for a waveform with period T. So in other words, um, the waveform is repeating itself every um, T seconds. So here it is. It's going to be 1 over T times the integral of the average power I'm sorry, of the instantaneous power with respect to time. So let's look at this and let's just make sure we like this expression and this integral sign makes sense to us. If I integrate the instantaneous power by time, what I'm really doing is I'm multiplying power joules per second by time and I'm getting joules, so I'm getting energy. <clears throat> Let's go down to our integral. <clears throat> so when I integrate over one period, the power times time, I'm getting the energy in one period. Divide the energy divided by time and I'm getting power. See that? So I'm getting the average energy per unit time. That's power. Okay, and I'm just going to show again that the when I do my instantaneous power, remember it can have a constant part and a time varying part. And the time varying part is always going to integrate to zero, but the constant part is going to integrate to a constant. Okay, so now what I want to do <clears throat> is let's say that V of T and I of T are expressed as phasors. <clears throat> seems to come out of the blue, but we use phasers for our sinusoidal analysis. And so let's say V of T and I of T are expressed as phasers because we're working with sine waves. And this isn't really a derivation. This is just really a cool way to show you that the result works. So 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's just look at this formula. One half times the phasor quantity V, which is, of course, complex quantity in general, times the complex conjugate of the current. I just pulled this out of my hat, but I want to play with it and look at it. Now, let's look at complex conjugate first. If I is some value, some magnitude at an angle up here, its complex conjugate means that I just invert the complex part, which means my complex part goes down here. So the complex conjugate is the same phasor, but with a negative phase angle. See that? So what that means is when I multiply these, I'm going to get my one half, of course, V max times I max, but my phase angle is going to be the phase of the voltage minus the phase of the current because it's the complex conjugate. So, okay, that sounds like fun. So now let's, um, let's take a look at this. It's going to be, if I put this back in the rectangular domain, this is going to look like one half V max times I max times the cosine of the difference in the phases plus J times one half V max times the sine of the phases. I'm just using Euler's identity. Now, there's there are no... Uh, vectors swirling around here. This is a constant. And I look at this and I say, hey, the real part, look at that formula. That looks like our formula that we had right here and right here for average power. 1 half V max I max cosine phi V minus phi I. And I played my little game with this cool little formula, and I said, hey, the real part is the average power. So what we're going to say is power is equal to the real part of the voltage times the complex conjugate of the current, which is the same thing as saying one half times V max I max cosine phase angle between them. So now let's look at power dissipated by components. And this is where I'm going to give you a little bit of intuitive insight that seems really simple, but it can be really useful. Um, I'm going to take my formula for average power and I'm going to apply it to resistors, capacitors, and inductors. So my basic formula is one half V max I max cosine phase angle between them. We'll start off with the resistor where the voltage and the current are in phase. So that means phi V minus phi I, that's going to be zero. So this cosine is going to turn into a one. So the average power for a resistor is one half times V max times I max. And using Ohm's law, you can show that that's equal to one half I max squared times R. Now, these formulas look somewhat similar to us because we're used to saying, well, power is equal to voltage times current. But here, I'm saying that power is equal to one half V max times I max. So I want you to take everything that we've been working with and think about it for a second. What's the answer to my question? Why isn't power just V times I like it is for DC? Why is that one half in there?
Here's why. Because the voltage and the current are not always at their maximum values. Let's go up here. Here we looked at the instantaneous power V times I, and we found that sometimes it's really big and sometimes it's really small. But if I had just V max times I max here, it would be big all the time. But it's not, because sometimes I have a big voltage when the cosine's at its peak or its valley, and sometimes I have no voltage, which is when the cosine is going through zero. So I certainly can't say that the power is equal to uh, V max times I max. Well, it turns out that what we derive just above is that the average power is equal to one half V max times I max. So that's the answer to my question. And here is our formula for power um, dissipated by a resistor. Now let's go to the inductor. And let's do a little background on our inductor first. V over I phasor is equal to J omega L, or V is equal to J omega L times I. And several lectures ago, we showed that multiplying by J is really a shift of 90 degrees. So the voltage and the current for the inductor are 90 degrees out of phase. And so let's use our basic formula. Power equals 1 half V max I max cosine phi V minus phi I. These are out of phase by 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 is going to be zero. So there's no average power dissipated in an inductor. An inductor is an energy storage element. You can shove it energy into it and it'll give you the energy back and you can shove energy into it and they have this little energy party but they don't dissipate power, so they don't get hot. At least not in 310, because all our inductors are perfect and they have no series resistance. But in the inductor dissipates no power. And here is why. Just our little equation to the rescue. Now let's go to the capacitor. Now I have V over I, my impedance, again, is equal to 1 over J omega C, or V equals I times 1 over J omega C. And we put that J upstairs, but the bottom line is we can see that the voltage and current are 90 degrees out of phase. Of course, it's opposite of this 90 degrees, but the cosine is a symmetric function, so you can see where we're going to get where we're going with this. So for the capacitor, the voltage and the current are 90 degrees out of phase. So again, I use my simple little formula here, and I get cosine of 90 or plus 90 or minus 90. I mean, I don't care whether it's plus 90 or minus 90. The cosine is nice and symmetric. It's going to be zero and I have no average power dissipated in a capacitor. Let's look, actually, before we go there, that, let's look at something that might help us with problems, because I promised you that at the beginning of the lecture. Um, if I know that this power supply is delivering, say, 10 watts, and this power supply is delivering 10 watts, what's power dissipated in this resistor? It's 20 watts. This one's generating 10 watts. This one's generating 10 watts. I'm not dissipating any power here. I'm not dissipating any power here. 10 watts plus 10 watts 
20 watts. So you see how you can do that? You have kind of a big complicated circuit, but these guys aren't dissipating any power. So if there's power coming out of these supplies, it's not getting dissipated here and here. It's getting dissipated here. So that just sometimes makes um, problems a little easier. So we did our resistor and our inductor and our capacitor. Let's look at a power supply. And we're going to use our passive sign convention. Um, here it is for our resistor. Of course, for our power supply, the passive sign convention would have the current going down this way. So I know that my power dissipated by the resistor is V times I. It's positive. The power dissipated by the supply is V times negative I, because remember, I'm defining passive sign convention, the current goes this way, but I know the current's going this way. So it's V times, negative V times I. So the power supply dissipates negative power. That means it provides positive power, right? Two wrongs make a right in logic, dissipates negative. So the power supply provides power. Let's calculate the power dissipated in this circuit. So what we've seen is we could do this in a couple of different ways. One way we could do it is by saying, how much power is this power supply delivering? Um, so we could do that by just saying, where is it here? One half V max I max times the cosine of the difference between the voltage and the current. And that would give us the power dissipated in the circuit because we know the power uh, that's coming from the supply is what's going to be dissipated. We could also say, let's just calculate the power dissipated by the 30 ohm resistor. And it's going to give us the exact same result because we know that our capacitor isn't dissipating any power. So let's do it for the resistor. So what we'll do is we'll get the current um, through the resistor, then we'll get the voltage across it, and then we'll use the formula that we just derived. We'll use this one-half real V times I conjugate. So we start off by getting the current, which is V over Z. And Z is going to be 30 minus J70, because that's going to because dividing the voltage by the impedance it sees is going to give us the current. So 120 plus J0, that's our supply, divided by 30 minus J70, gives us 1.58 at an angle of 66.8 degrees. Now the voltage across the resistor is the current times the resistance. So it's just going to be 1.58 at an angle of 66.8 degrees multiplied by 30 ohms. So now let's get the power. It's going to be 1 half times the real part of the voltage across the resistor times the complex conjugate of the current through the resistor. It's going to be 1 half times the real part of here is our voltage and here is the conjugate of our current. And what we see is that these phase angles are going to cancel out and I'm going to end up with just one half times the real part of 1.58 times 30 times 1.58, which is going to be um, 74.89. So one half of times 74.89 gives me 37.44 watts. 37.44 watts 
is the power dissipated in the resistor. 37.44 watts is the power delivered by the supply. Negative 37.44 watts is the power dissipated by the supply. So let's put things in perspective. We got a number here. Um, how many joules are delivered to the resistor in 10 seconds? Well, power is joules per second. So let's multiply by seconds and we'll get joules. So in 10 seconds, we're going to get 374.4 joules. Now what we're going to do is we're going to shape that resistor. We're going to give that resistor um, uh, the shape of a golf ball. So we've got a golf ball and it's dissipating 37.44 watts. You going to hold it in your hand? It's just a number, 37.44 watts. Going to burn your hand? Um, some of you might remember that light bulbs um, used to be incandescent. And 99.9 something percent of the power that went into a light bulb was dissipated as heat. So what I've done in the past, if I want a heat source of so many watts, I just go buy a light bulb. Um, in this case, this is a 45 watt light bulb, so it's pretty close to 37.4 watts. So I'm gonna turn this light bulb on. It's a 45 watt bulb. It's gonna happen if I put my hand over there. Yeah, I'm gonna get burned, aren't I? So use, you can use light bulbs as kind of an approximation for, you know, to give you an intuitive feel for, you know, how much power is 100 watts? How much power is 200 watts? All right. So let's go to a practical power formula because the little secret is when I interview engineers, none of them are going to know any of these formulas. None of them are going to remember this. And let's look at why. So in the previous example, we know that only the resistor can dissipate power. And we also know that the voltage and the current for the resistor are in phase. So what that means is the power dissipated by a resistor is one half V max times I max. Forget the phase angle. So V max equals I max times R. So I can replace that V max with I max R and I get power is one half I max times R times I max or one half I max squared times R. Do you see a phase angle here? You don't. So if I want the power in a resistor, in a resistor, that's kind of colloquial, dissipated by a resistor, all I really need is the maximum current through it. I don't care about the phase. And that's why most engineers cannot tell you those equations that we went through. But you got to be able to tell them to me when you take the quiz. So in the last example, we said that the current was equal to um, 1.58 amps at 66.8 degrees. Forget the 66.8. I max is 1.58 amps. I max was 1.58 amps. That's the magnitude of the current. So the power is just one half. I max squared times 30 is 37.4 watts. Don't hold that resistor in your hand. 
So this is a really practical thing. And this is what you'll be using long after you've forgotten. I hope you don't forget. But if you do forget those formulas that we just um, uh, derived, don't forget them until after the final. But this is what you're going to see uh, people using out in the field. So now what we want to do is calculate the power. I said absorbed here. That's kind of a dumb word. It's really dissipated. Power dissipated by each of the five elements in the circuit. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Five elements. That's good. Um, so hmm, no power here, right? No power dissipation here. So only got power dissipation here. And these are going to be supplying power. But I don't really know that. But I suspect they will be. I'm not, I'm not going to say that they are um, supplying power. Because, for example, this power supply is only supplying power if it's spitting current out this way. If it, ha if it is eating current this way, even though it's a power supply, it's dissipating power, right? Because V times I is going to be positive. But either way, I know that the components I really got to worry about are my two power supplies and my resistor. So let's triage this thing. We kind of already got to start. The capacitor power is going to be zero. The inductor power is going to be zero. And I can say the power dissipated by source one plus the power dissipated by source two plus the power dissipated by the resistor is equal to zero. Um, I don't have a magic energy generation machine in here. I just have a circuit. So really what that's saying is the power from the source sources is equal to the power dissipated in the resistors. You notice how I said dissipation versus supplied puts a negative sign in there. So, okay, that's all good, but how am I going to get that power dissipation? If I can get the two mesh currents, here they are, this one and this one, I can say that the power dissipated in the resistor is going to be one half I1 squared magnitude times R, or one half times the magnitude of the current squared times R. That's the, um, that is going to be the power dissipated here. The power dissipated um, by source one is going to be negative, and we'll get to that negative in a second, one half times Vs1, which is right here, times I1 times the cosine of the difference in the phase angle between V1 or Vs1 and I1. And you might you say, why do you have a negative sign here? And the reason I have a negative sign here is because I1 is defined as coming out of the supply, not going in to the supply. OK, so here's Vs1, and then the power in Vs2, you notice we don't have a negative sign. I have 1 half Vs2 times I2 times the phase angle between them. But notice that I2 is going into this supply following the passive sign convention. So I don't have a negative sign here. So um, take a good look at these negative signs and make sure that you're comfortable with them. So, but what I have at this point, if we just kind of take stock of things, power in the resistor, 
power dissipated by source one, power dissipated by source two, they better add up to zero. So let's get I1 and I2. We're pretty good at this by now. So I'm going to just write a couple of equations. Say minus Vs1 plus I1 times 8 ohms plus I1 minus I2 times minus J2 equals zero. And then I'll make a similar mesh equation here. And just like I do with all these problems, I give them um, their, their numbers. Of course, in this one, the number fell right on the uh, little binder punch hole, but there should be a one here. Here's my raw mesh equation. Here it is. Uh, ready to be thrown into the matrix because I've separated out my two unknowns, I1 and I2. I do the same thing um, with mesh two, and I throw it into my matrix, and I, I get I1 is five at an angle of 53.13, and I2 is 13.6 at an angle of minus 162.9. Let's start off with our resistor. Its power dissipation is going to be 1 half times magnitude I1 squared times 8, or in other words, 1 half times 5 squared times 8 is 100 watts. The power dissipated in source one is going to be one half times Vs1 magnitude times I1 magnitude. We know Vs1, we just calculated I1 times the cosine of the angle between them. And I work all that out and I get minus 60 watts. Now let's look at source two. And same thing, except I don't have my negative sign here because I2 is entering the positive terminal of source 2. One half magnitude Vs2 times magnitude Is2, which is, of course, just I2, times the cosine of the angle between them. Um, Remember, I2 has this 162.9, so here's the angle between them, and I get minus 40 watts. Let's look at our equation where we said that um, the power dissipated had to add up. Dissipated by source 2, minus 40, plus minus 60, uh, plus 100, equals 0. So or in other words, the power adds up. We see that the power dissipated in source one and source two are both negative. So these sources are supplying power and it's all getting cooked in that 100 watt resistor. 100 watts, don't hold it in your hand. Now let's move to maximum power transfer. And I know you've seen this before in your previous classes, but I want to put a little more intuition behind it so that you'll get a good feel for it and actually show you a good example of where it's used and why it's so useful. So let's start off by considering a Thevenin source. So Here's my Thevenin source with its Thevenin voltage, and it's got its um, Z Thevenin here, which is generally complex. There's a resistor um, uh, in series with an inductor or a capacitor or something in our Thevenin model. So I want to look at how much power I can put into a load. Let's load the source with an inductor. Let's put an inductor here. How much power do we get? We get none because inductors don't dissipate power. Now let's load the source with a capacitor. We put our capacitor 
right out here. And again, I don't get any power in my load because capacitors don't dissipate power. Now let's load the source with an open circuit. So the open circuit is, I'm going to get the, the maximum possible voltage I can get because there's no current in Z thevenin, so my V thevenin is going to uh, appear right here. So I'm getting the maximum amount of voltage, but I don't get any current. So there's no way I can get power. And now let's load the source with a short circuit. So now I'm going to get the maximum possible current, but I have no voltage. And we remember in our formulas um, for power, we always see a V times an I, unless we're solving for I and we use I squared um, uh, R. And you would see that those would give us the same result. Like for example here, we have um, an open circuit, I would be zero. Um, short circuit, if we're using I squared R, um, then R would be zero because it's a short circuit. But basically what I'm showing is inductors not going to dissipate power, capacitors not going to dissipate power, and if I put an open there, I'm going to get voltage but no current. And if I put a short here, I'm going to get current, but no voltage. So what's needed to dissipate power here? A big resistor? Nope, no power because I don't get much current. Small resistor? No, because the power, I'm not going to get any power because with a small resistor, the voltage is going to be really low. So it's kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It's got to be just right. So for DC, we know you've learned that for a source with Stevenin resistance RS, the maximum power transfer occurs when RL equals RS. Now, mm -hmm. if you want, um, you can actually do kind of a little calculus optimization problem and prove that because you'll see that if RS is really low, the power is nothing, and if RS is really large, the power is nothing, but there's going to be a peak where that derivative equals zero. So you can solve for it, and it's cool, and it's summer, so maybe you have time to do that. But before I move on, I want to show you a really tricky interview question. Um, some people, when they interview people, they, um, they try to slip them up or they try to show how smart they are or whatever. And I think that's absolute um, nonsense in an interview. You just want to know what people know. But for some reason, some people like to try to slip people up. And this is one of the classic tricky interview questions. I give you a circuit like this and forget EE310. Think EE210 because you don't need 310 to be tricked by this. I give you this circuit and I say, pick RS for maximum power transfer. And you're given RL, so pick RS. And what people, the banana peel they slip on is they say, oh, well, RS has to be equal to RL. So if they have 100 ohms here, they say, oh, I need 100 ohms here. It's absolutely wrong. Um, for maximum power transfer, um, you pick the load so that it is equal to the source resistor. So it occurs, I stated it correctly here, for a source with Thevenin resistance RS, the maximum tra power transfer occurs when RL equals RS. Here, we ask the question wrong. <clears throat> We said, given RL, pick RS. <clears throat> and we didn't apply maximum power transfer uh, correctly. If I want to get the maximum power in this load, the way this question is asked, I'm going to put a short circuit here because I don't want to waste any of my power in this resistor. So, <clears throat> 
kind of a tricky interview question, <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> lectures are a good place for putting banana peels under you guys. But by separating this out from this, you're going to understand maximum power transfer better. And that's why I threw it at you. So now let's look at maximum power transfer for AC circuits. <clears throat> and there's a nice derivation of this in the text. Um, for the edition that we were using, it's on 460, page 465. I think on the new edition, it's on a different page, but you can find it. Let's do an intuitive quote derivation so that we really get a better feel for it. <clears throat> So I know that load power will be dissipated only in the resistive part of the load. So here's my load, and I know that I'm only going to dissipate power in this resistive part of it. So let's say <clears throat> that Jx of S plus Jx of L is equal to zero. Or in other words, this, this imaginary part cancels out this imaginary part. Well, if I do that, then my circuit looks like just the two resistors. And for maximum power transfer, we want R sub L to equal R sub S. Now let's say that J X of S and J X of L don't add up to zero. Well, that means that this voltage supply is gonna see a bigger magnitude of the impedance because you know that this supply is always gonna see RS plus RL. You can't get around that, but that is on the real axis. But what these two add up to are going to be on the imaginary axis. They may be up, they may be down, but when they don't add up to zero, the magnitude of this impedance is going to be larger. So, in and if the magnitude is larger, I'm going to get a lower magnitude of current. If I get a lower magnitude of current, I'm squirting less current through this resistor and I'm getting less power. So to get the greatest power in this resistor, I need the most current I can. And that means I want to minimize the impedance, seen, the magnitude of the impedance seen by the source. So I'm going to say, hey, let's make Jx of S um, plus Jx of L add up to zero. So if Jx of S plus Jx of L is zero, then Jx of S is equal to minus Jx of L and we see we're inverting the imaginary part. So Z sub L is equal to the conjugate, complex conjugate of Z sub S. In other words, if I want to pick <clears throat> the load here that will result in maximum power transfer, I'm just going to look at my source impedance and say, I want the complex conjugate. That means I just invert the imaginary part and I'm going to get, um, well, I'm going to get negative Jx of S over here. And here's the equation that describes that. So in when you were working with just resistors, you said, R load equals R source. But for AC circuits, we're going to say R uh, Z load equals the complex conjugate of Z source. <clears throat> so let's do an example. Find Z load for maximum power transfer. <coughs> 
and then find the maximum power that will be delivered to your load. <clears throat> so here's our circuit. And we've got um, 27 volts at an angle of zero degrees. Uh, we've got our frequency of one megahertz. We're going to need that because we were our inductor was specified <clears throat> with its inductance, not its impedance. So here is our our Thevenin source resistance or source impedance. <coughs> 2.3 microhenries and 38 ohms. So let's, let, actually, let's ask another question about this right off the bat. Um, tell me what ZL is going to look like. I, wa I don't want numbers. I just want to know what it's going to look like. Don't do numbers. I just want to know what it's going to look like. Is it going to be in another inductor and a resistor? Is it going to be a capacitor? What's it going to be? You can answer that right off the top of your head because you know that this is going to give you plus J something because the impedance is going to be J omega L. And you know that in order to get a negative J over here, you got to use a capacitor to do that. So just looking at this circuit, I can say, for maximum power transfer, I'm going to have 38 ohms in series with a capacitor. So Z source is equal to 38 plus the impedance of the inductor, which is 38 plus J 2 pi times the frequency times 2.3 microhenries, or 38 plus J 14.45. And I know that my Z load, this is not Z of the inductor, right? This is Z load, is going to be equal to the complex conjugate of Z source. So Z load is going to be 38 minus J 14.45. It's negative. That's a negative J, so we need a capacitor. So we're going to say minus J 14.45 is equal to 1 over J omega C. Calculate out C, and I get 11.01 .01 nanofarads. What if you goofed and said, I want to put an inductor here? <laughs> Simple. You'd get a negative value of inductance. Good luck finding one of those. So now let's look at the effective circuit. The inductive, I'm sorry, the imaginary parts canceled, so I'm left with just my 238 ohm resistors. Let's figure out how much power we're going to get at maximum power transfer. I know that the current now is going to be just Vs divided by RL plus RL, or Vs divided by 2RL. And the maximum power is going to be 1 half I max squared times RL, because we like this formula, right? And if I substitute in my I max, I'm going to just get Vs squared divided by 4RL squared, or in other words, I'm just squaring this. And I work, I put things together and I get it is equal to Vs squared divided by 8RL. And this is kind of a cool little formula. So they actually put it um, in your book. Um, so for our example, it's going to be 27 squared divided by 8 times 38, and I'm going to get 2.4 watts. Okay, uh, if you're in my class, you're going to see this supplement posted on Blackboard. But what I'm looking for here, let's see, can I... Make this a little smaller, sure can. 
What I want to know is the load that can be placed between terminals A and B that will receive maximum power transfer from the circuit. I asked the question correctly. I said, you're given this Thevenin source over here. So I want to know what load we're going to put here so we get maximum power, and then I want to know what that value of maximum power is. So if you're out there on the internet and you're not in my class, do a screenshot of this uh, and do the problem. Here are my, here's some clues. Use KVL or KCL to get V Thevenin. And then for the Thevenin impedance, see case two on page 140 of our textbook, Alexander and Saitaku Electric Circuits, which is an excellent book. Um, and what that does is it allows you to handle this dependent source. And then the way, but the way I prefer getting Z Thevenin is not this way. The way I like to do it is I say, let's just short circuit this thing. And then what we'll do is say that Z Thevenin is equal to V Thevenin divided by I short circuit. So in other words, um, here's how you're going to get V Thevenin. And then for the Thevenin impedance, you can either do this, which in my opinion is kind of complicated, though there are some problems where this is the only way to do it. But for this problem, do what I showed in the last lecture for Thevenin and just short circuit this rascal and then say that your Thevenin impedance is V Thevenin that you got up here divided by I short circuit. So I'm going to leave this up for just a second so you can freeze the video and get a screenshot of it. And while you're doing that, I will see you in the next lecture. If you're in my class, I hope to see you in office hour tomorrow.